Welcome back everyone to another reaction video as we dive into part two of Extra History's series on Vlad the Impaler. Well, as several of you pointed out, and I knew this somewhere along the line but had forgotten and didn't mention it yesterday, uh, the current royal family of the United Kingdom are in fact direct descendants of Vlad the Impaler. Uh, it actually comes through Mary of Teck, who was married to King George V. And so beginning with King George VI, and now his daughter, Queen Elizabeth II, and all future uh, monarchs of the United Kingdom, they will all be direct descendants of Vlad III. Uh, it's actually, uh, George VI would be a 12th great-grandson of Vlad the Impaler. They actually descend from three different lines. Uh, from Vlad, but they all end up back in Mary of Tech, who is descended from a Hungarian no noble family. So uh, interesting kind of tidbit there. And I know that Prince Charles is aware of this and has spoken of it. Uh, he's got a fondness for Romania and owns some property there. Uh, so just kind of a, a fun did you know. I've seen sites and places that claim that Vlad has no living descendants. That is absolutely 100% not true. He has many, many living descendants today. Uh, his uh, the the royal descent died out that line, but he's got many descendants alive. So let's dive into part two. Ottoman Empire, 1447. This is how Romanian folklore says it happened. When Vlad Dracul was being run down in a marsh, when he knew that he'd be caught and killed by the pretender Vladislav. He gave his sword and pendant to a loyal boyar. Take them to my son. For five days, the boyar rode, evading enemies and crossing rivers, until he entered the Ottoman Empire and presented them to Vlad Dracula. And as the boyar recounted the deaths of his father and brother, Dracula stood staring at the sword and pendant, both given to his father by Sigismund, both marked with the iconography of the Order of the Dragon. Uh, so speaking of the Order of the Dragon, another common thing I was getting yesterday, especially from folks who speak Romanian, uh, telling me that, hey, uh, Dracula um, actually, or, or Dracul actually means devil, not dragon. Um, yes and no. Today, modern Romanian, yes, that absolutely does mean devil. Uh, in the 15th century, it was translated as dragon. That was certainly how they understood it. Uh, it was Old Romanian. Languages change over time. Uh, the name actually in Old Romanian would have been Draculea, uh, but it, in modern Romanian, it's Dracula, means son of the dragon. Uh, but yeah, the, the name has come to mean devil as well over time. And, and that's a common thing, dragon and devil. Uh, if you look in the book of Revelation and the Bible, the devil is often depicted as a dragon. So that's a pretty common thing. And obviously, when people were trying to demonize Vlad the uh, Third, it, it was an easy thing for them to make that leap from calling him the son of the dragon to calling him son of the devil. And there, the 17-year-old Vlad Dracula swore that he would not rest until he had avenged his murdered kin and that he would personally, with his own hand, slay the pretender Vladislav. Revenge. Classic. While the story we started with may be folklore, it does capture a solid truth. When John Hunyadi's invasion killed Vlad's father and brother, it put the teenage hostage into play. Murad seems to have told Vlad of the deaths himself, and then followed it up by making him an officer in the Ottoman military. Because despite the greater popularity of his younger brother Radu, Vlad's seriousness and determination had convinced Sultan Murad that this was the prince they wanted ruling Wallachia as an ally. And considering how brutally Hunyadi and his allies had killed Vlad's family, Murad also assumed that any chance of the young prince defecting to the Hungarians was most likely buried alive with Vlad's older brother. So the Ottomans are seeing this as a win for them, right? I mean, this guy's got a blood oath to go after the Hungarians now because the Hungarians are responsible for the death of his father and brother. There's no chance he's going to side with them. There's no chance he's going to turn on us. We've got a strong, committed ally moving forward. Plus, it was the perfect time to reclaim Wallachia for the Dracul dynasty. For when John Hunyadi and Vladislav marched into Ottoman-held Serbia, Murad had dealt them a shattering defeat outside Kosovo. In fact, the route was so chaotic that no one even knew if Hunyadi or Vladislav had survived. Seeing his chance, Vlad stormed into Wallachia with a Turkish cavalry force and seized the throne. 
a dramatic beginning to a powerful and bloody reign. Soon, Vlad would take revenge on the boyars who had betrayed his father and brother, and would carve a swath across all of the land of- wait, no. Oops, <laughs> sorry. Funny story, Vladislav actually turned up, both very alive and with an army, recaptured the throne, and sent Vlad back into exile. I read somewhere, I don't know if this is true or not, that uh, that Vlad the Third, Vlad Shtep uh, Tepish as he's uh, commonly known, and I don't remember the, the origin of that word. It's T-E-P-E-S is how it's spelled. Um, but um, Vlad actually spent more time imprisoned than he did on the throne. His first reign lasted all of two months. At first, he fled back to the Ottomans, but things weren't safe there either. Vladislav, though he'd accepted Hunyadi's help to be installed on the throne of Wallachia under the explicit agreement that he'd fight the Turks, was discovering the same thing Vlad's father had. Wallachia simply couldn't survive against the Ottomans without Hungarian aid, and Hungary was a mess. Soon Wallachian boyars pressured him to make peace with the Sultan. So he sent envoys to Sultan Murad looking to strike a deal, and Vlad, rightfully worried his death might be a condition of the bargain, mm. fled to Moldavia. And Vlad received a warm welcome there. For that year, his uncle had become the ruler of Moldavia and his cousin Stephen the heir apparent. And the three years that Vlad spent there, connecting with his cousin and getting a renaissance education, were likely some of the happiest of his life. Stephen must be a very common name in that part of the world. I'm sure there's a reason why. There's probably a Saint Stephen uh, where that name comes from because I know that in doing my own research into Hungary, where my, my wife's grandfather's family's from, uh, Stephen is by far the most common name that I run into in researching those names. Istvan, I think it is, uh, in Hungarian. But um, I'm going to have to look that up. I'm sure there's a St. Stephen that they all commonly get named after, just like there's a St. George in England, and that's why you have so many Georges there. He even got a taste of military glory, helping his uncle and cousin turn back a Polish force. Good days. Though the time was abruptly cut short when his uncle's half-brother assassinated him and Vlad and Stephen both fled to Hungary, where he was forced to play cat and mouse with John Hunyadi, going from town to town, hiding with sympathetic boyars, and at one point slipping away just as a squad of ambushers tried to catch and assassinate him. I mean, this guy, he is running for his life, and this is the story of being a nobility whose family is on the outs, is that everybody wants to hunt you down and kill you because you're a threat to their reign, uh, and you're a source for anybody who wants to rebel against the person who's on the throne. Uh, they can rebel in your name, even if you're not actively involved in it. This happens all the time. Then everything changed again. First, Sultan Murad died. And in his place rose his more vigorous and ambitious son, Mehmed, who declared it his top priority to finally conquer Constantinople. A goal made possible, since while the city was still a trade center and symbolically important, it had declined in military power. Hunyadi's star was falling as well. While he was still revered as the most famous crusader against the Turks, his two recent defeats had tarnished his reputation. I mean, a few years before, he'd essentially ruled Hungary on behalf of a child king, but now he was back to just being a plain old prince of Transylvania. And then Vladislav. Well, Vladislav was aligning ever closer with the Ottomans, meaning Hunyadi was suddenly shopping for a new prince of Wallachia. Mm. Which said we talked about this yesterday. It's you know being that buffer zone that is uh, a client state of one or the other at any given time. Uh, these two powerful rulers in Hungary and the Ottoman Empire are constantly looking for an ally that can be on that throne. And if the current person on the throne is allied with your enemy, then you're going to be looking for anybody who's available that you can uh, support to overthrow that enemy. And, and this is not unique to this part of the world. That's something that also happened all over the place. Look at Scotland. You know, uh, the Balliols and the, the Bruces and all this, you know, the time of William the, William Wallace, this is going on, where, uh, you know, King Edward I, Longshanks is, uh, of England, uh, is looking for somebody he can, he can support on that throne that's going to be loyal to him. Set up an interesting space for an approach between Hunyadi and Vlad, because each did have something the other wanted. Hunyadi could give Vlad legitimacy, official recognition in Hungary, and a path to reclaim his throne. And in turn, Vlad could give Hunyadi an able partner who knew the Ottoman military and leadership from the inside, and who could replace Vladislav if necessary. Striking this deal, however, meant that Vlad would need to join the man who'd slaughtered his family. To suck it up. 
But in an ironic twist, Vlad's father of all people had prepared him for this decision back when he'd abandoned Vlad as a hostage with the Ottomans. Politics was in person. Uh. And if reclaiming his throne meant foregoing vengeance, then so be it. And you know, that's a lesson that seems to have gotten lost in modern politics, that politics isn't personal. It has become very, very personal. Uh, not only among politicians, but all, also among regular people. Like, you know, it, anymore, it grows increasingly difficult uh, to find people even being kind to one another if they disagree agree with them politically. Um, but you go back, you know, even a generation or more, and, um, you know, here in America, I've talked about this before, people like uh, Ronald Reagan, who's a Republican president, and Tip O'Neill, who's the Democrat Speaker of the House, uh, had very famous, huge political battles, but were very friendly behind the scenes because they recognized and they lived that idea that politics wasn't personal. Uh, it's hard to do that these days. Vlad became a noble at Hunyadi's court, and his new patron took him to the coronation of the new Hungarian king, Ladislaus the Posthumous, where he took an oath, formally, to act as an ally of Hungary and the Catholic Church. His role would be the same as his father's, halting the Ottomans' advance and reclaiming Christian lands. And with his oath sworn, the Hungarian Diet charged Vlad with defending the Transylvanian frontier against the Ottomans and their Wallachian allies, a duty his father also held. News of Constantinople's fall in 1453, while no surprise, did sour the celebrations. And so this is the time in which this, which this is happening, right? I mean, this is one of the biggest events in world history. This is like a lot of times people point to this as a uh, one of those milestones in history where you talk about before the fall of Constantinople and after the fall of Constantinople as being, you know, sometimes they talk about this as being the end of the medieval period. Uh, and this is the time in which Vlad is living and he's, on the front lines of these events. Stories had filtered in that the Ottomans had impaled prisoners in front of the city walls, a punishment used by both Ottomans and German Saxons as a way to scare the garrison into surrendering. Believing the city would fall and wanting to preserve his strength for defending his own territory, Hunyadi opted against sending troops to Constantinople. But he knew that Mehmed would not stop with the bastion of Eastern Christendom and the next place on the chopping block would be the Hungarian frontier city of Belgrade. So in 1456, he whipped up an army of mercenaries and marched to relieve the city, leaving Vlad to defend the pass into Transylvania and keep Vladislav tied down. Hunyadi's forces reached Belgrade just as the besieged city was ready to fall, broke through the Turkish lines, and managed to get inside the citadel to reinforce the beleaguered garrison. They broke the siege, repelling Mehmed's forces after weeks of combat. Hunyadi, the white knight who had fought the Ottomans for decades, had relieved Belgrade, an event described as a miracle. But a miracle that went sour, as plague swept into his camp, mm. killing Hunyadi and the expedition's other leader. <laughs> so you win, but you really lose. And again, this is a time in history when more people die during war from disease than they do from battle wounds. This guy wins the battle, but then dies from disease. And that happens anytime you bring lots of people together from all over the place and you put them in camps where disease can just become prevalent. But Vlad Dracula had little time to mourn the enemy turned mentor, for his goal had been to tie up Vladislav's forces, and he knew the best way to do it invasion. As he crossed into his homeland, he looked up to see a fell star burning in the heavens Holly's Comet a celestial body that people across the world interpreted as either a sign of impending catastrophe or great events. And meeting his enemy's army outside the Wallachian capital of Targovishta, Vlad took the burning star as a sign of coming victory. We know little about what happened next. So Haley's Comet, um, I never heard it pronounced Holly's before, but maybe that's how other people pronounce it. Uh, Haley's Comet, uh, I think every 75 years, and it was the 1980s. I want to say like 1985 was when we saw it when I was a kid. So I, I probably won't live long enough to see it again. If I do, I'll be in my 80s. According to one story, the relatively small armies clashed. But in another, the forces decided to settle the issue by single combat. Vlad Dracula, son of the dragon, against his cousin Vladislav, prince of Wallachia. Though in both versions, Vlad slays the pretender with his own hand. When he took the throne, his coins were stamped with the five-tailed comet, the symbol of his victory. But that victory would be difficult to hold on to, 
because while he agreed to pay Mehmed 2,000 gold as tribute and agreed to let the Ottoman armies cross his lands, these agreements were only to buy time for him to build mm. and repair more fortresses and solve internal problems at home. For the faction of boyars who had brought him to the throne were a small minority of the nobility. Most had supported the slain Vladislav, including those who had risen up and killed Vlad's brother at the prompting of John Hunyadi. Indeed, it was only months into his second reign when a young boyar raised an army of mercenaries to dethrone the young prince. But Vlad ambushed the little band as they marched toward Targovishta and made an example of them no one would miss. His troops sharpened long there sticks, it is. greased them, and then shoved them into the bodies of the noble and all his male kin. Then he left them, still living, beside the road to die over the coming days. Over time, he would refine this gruesome method of execution until history remembered him chiefly for the brutal spectacle. Vlad the Impaler had arrived. Raising the stakes. All right. So we're about to get into the more bloody part of his uh, history. Uh, and of course, there's a lot more to the story than what they cover just in these short videos. But let me know your thoughts. Uh, use the comment section below and add to this story of what we've already discussed. And we will be back tomorrow with part three. Thanks for watching.